Okay, so where the hell am I going? Oh yeah, the Observatory de Paris. Looks like a safe area. Well, let's get over there, shall we? And see what happens. Hey, a sundial. Well, there it is. That was pretty quick. Uh, it doesn't look like a whole lot from here, but this place is pretty freaking cool. Let's see what it says. Louis the Fourteenth, man, he was freaking awesome. Yeah, I'm really, the more I learn about the city, the more I'm coming to respect him. Jeez. Oh, man. This place had to be freaking crazy to build, man. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, I guess I'll go into detail about the observatory. The reason why it was built was because France was kind of in a maritime struggle with the rest of Europe, you know, Spain and England and the Dutch. So they wanted to build a observatory to help them figure out longitude and that kind of stuff. The project was commissioned by Louis XIV. And yeah, like I was saying, I mean, I'm really... The more I learn about France and Paris and everything, Louis the Fourteenth, man, he was just a badass. I mean, he was fighting wars all over Europe, and he was also a huge patron of the arts and sciences. And his minister of finance, Jean Baptiste Colbert, was uh, definitely pushing this project. The project started in 1667 and was finished in 1671. Colbert got the architect Claude Perrault to design it. Claude Perrault was a pretty cool guy. I mean, he was very, very intelligent. He worked on the east facade of the Louvre, and he was just a brilliant guy. Like, he translated the only surviving book on architecture from ancient Rome, I think it was written by Vitruvius, and uh, he translated that whole thing, and uh, he just worked on tons of famous projects like the Louvre and stuff, and uh, yeah, he definitely had a pretty good time designing this, I bet. So just all the special things he had to do to help keep the sensitive equipment working, like no metal in the area and stuff, so I'm sure this project had its fair share of interesting and unique challenges. But yeah, Claude Perrault would have been a pretty interesting guy to meet just because he was a genius in so many fields. Like he was a physician and atomist and physics and natural history. I mean, he, this guy was just, I guess you could say he was a renaissance man. And his brother, Charles Perrault, is a pretty cool guy. He actually wrote new versions of old fairy tales and kind of helped bring these stories back to being popular like Little Red Riding Hood, Cinderella, Person Boots, Sleeping Beauty, and Bluebeard. And his versions of these stories would go on to inspire later writers like the Brothers Grimm and stuff. So yeah, his brother was pretty cool too. I wonder what it would be like living in a family full of successful and brilliant people. <laughs> it's probably pretty cool back then. Nowadays they would probably just be annoying assholes, but whatever. So when the observatory was complete, they had Giuseppe Campani, who was the best telescope and optics guy probably in the world at the time. They had him supply all the telescopes and all that stuff. And the building was added on several times over the years. And uh, it definitely went on to be a pretty important building. Like the world's first national almanac was published from there. And they were able to help sailors by kind of figuring out longitude. And uh, they came up with weather maps. And even in 1913, 
by using the Eiffel Tower as an antenna, they were able to exchange messages, wireless messages with observatories in the United States to kind of help determine the exact longitude between France and America. So that's kind of cool, yeah. And the first director of the observatory, Giovanni Cassini, actually discovered a couple of Saturn's moons by using the observatory. And oddly enough, his family would kind of go on to be the directors of the observatory for several generations, which is kind of cool. Like Giovanni, when he died, his son Jacques took over and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just a cool, cool building. Okay, let's actually take a look around here. Out of the way. Fuckheads. I am trying to give a fucking tour, asshole. Zivitoe. Yeah, this building is still around. It's actually still a pretty important observatory in France. I don't know how. You would think the City of Lights would be a bit bright, but... I guess they're still able to use it. I think most of the uh, colleges and into institutions that use it are probably spread out a bit like this building isn't going to hold everybody but I guess if you want to use a telescope and stuff you come here well just shoot your buddy I don't know why, but that really looks more like a cannon to me. <laughs> it's like, cool, they got cannons up here. Swivel guns or something. No, they're just telescopes. Looks like they're building the observatory dome thing. It's pretty iconic for every observatory to have one of those. Stop, yeah, I just want to clear the area. I don't want any interruptions. Yeah, I'm looking up there. Into the blue yonder. Yeah, if only these guys were alive now to see what NASA's telescopes are finding. Well, imagine how cool it had to be back then being a astronomer. I mean, it really had to be freaking cool, man. You look in this glass tube and you see planets no one's ever seen before, like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and... You know, that's pretty freaking cool. And you can see the moons and stuff. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, it's telescopes back then. I mean, they had to be pretty freaking good. I mean, you could probably get a better one now at Walmart. But, I mean, with all the technology that went into making the glass and the optics and all that. I mean, it really is incredible. Oh, and you know, too, everything was made by hand at this time. So, I mean, they get the glass just right. I mean, jeez. I mean, the Italians were always great glass makers, so. Well, I mean, they were great makers of everything. Yeah. Clothes, shoes, art, architecture, food, <laughs> music. I mean, yeah. So yeah, this is a pretty cool building. Louis the Fourteenth would definitely be proud. Kind of crazy. It's already over a hundred years old in this game's time period. Yeah, like this freaking building's over a hundred years older than the United States. Kind of crazy. All right. 
Got a nice grounds around here. Nice little park. Huh. Wonder if that's still there nowadays. Be kind of a cool place to walk around. Yeah, I'm just running around checking it out. It's not really a whole lot to do here. Too bad I can't go inside. Yeah, this was actually built on the Meridian line of fonts, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, I guess I'll head for the Soul Ball next. This was built uh, a couple of years before the famous British Observatory. I guess I was like Greenwich Observatory. And I think these two institutions would actually go back and forth in competition against one another. Because they were both trying to figure out longitude and stuff, so. Well, I mean, whoever figures out longitude becomes master of the seas, pretty much. Because you're able to tell how far east and west you are in the world. <clears throat> so at the time... Shit. Sorry, trying to get out of here. So at the time, you only knew latitude. And I guess the only reason why they knew that was because of the crater room and shit and stuff. So figuring out where you are east and west would be pretty freaking important. Shit, how the fuck am I gonna get out of here? And like I said too, it took a long time to really, really figure out and pinpoint longitude. Like uh, they were having to use wireless radio signals between America and France to kind of figure out the exact longitude. I guess nowadays you would use GPS or satellites or something. Damn, what the fuck am I going to get out of here? Can't climb the wall. Get out of the fucking way, you wankers. Ow, what you mean my ass? Hey, books. Son of a bitch. Oh, hello, boys. Now for the fun bit. Bloody fucking hell. What was that? I'm so fucked. <laughs> Get out of here. Pick the bastard off! Dude, you are gonna die. Climb the tree, climb the tree. Jump over the bush, tree thing. Get up. Oh, I'm so dead. Nice. Nice. Look at that. Look at that health bar. I'm awesome. What the hell? Oh my god, I freaking made it out of there. Now watch some prick's gonna kill me here. Holy fuck, I think I made it. Okay, let's vacate the premises. Let's take a nice little stroll through Paris. I am not about to die at all. Alright, I'm on the way to the sore ball, but I didn't want to die on the way there, so I should probably try and get some health potion thing. Probably made out of arsenic and mercury, but hey, shit works. Get over here! I'll finish you quick if you ask me. I just realized the uh, bad guys sound British, not French. What the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> That's a rassle. Hey, it's the time before television. You gotta figure out something to do for fun. 
Yeah. Hey, right. give me my arsenic and mercury concoction. Dang, stuff ain't cheap. Right, let's go to school. Sundial again. So ball. Is that legal? There must be some old bylaw I could use. Place looks pretty freaking big and cool. Well, let's see what it says, shall we? Well, bear the so ball. Interesting. Yeah, when the Bobons came back, because that was Louis the Eighteenth. Let's go into the history of the Sorbonne. Basically, the Sorbonne was founded in 1253 by Robert de Sorbonne, who was the chaplain of Louis IX, King of France. And basically, Sorbonne established the Maison de Sorbonne, which was a school he founded for teaching 20 poor students, basically, how to be priests and stuff. And you know, it grew and grew. It was even sponsored by the king. And by the time of Sorbonne's death in 1274, the university was well on its way to becoming what it would become, basically the University of Paris. And like most colleges, especially the big famous ones, it started off as a religious theological school. And there are many reasons for that. Basically, if you wanted to be educated in the medieval world, you had to go to a church, basically. There you'd learn Latin, how to read and write, and maybe even some arithmetic. So it only makes sense that colleges would spring forth from the church. And basically the church needed to educate its future priests and cardinals and bishops, so it definitely just made sense. And you have to remember too, the Catholic Church had a lot of money and a lot of power, so if they wanted to start up a school, they could definitely do it. So over the centuries, the Sorbonne just grew and grew and had some pretty famous students who attended there. Like they even had a Pope, Pope Clement VI, who actually was a student there. And Madame Wei Tao Ming, who was the first female lawyer and judge in China's history. So that's kind of a big deal. But probably the most famous student who went there was Armand Jean de Plessis de Richelieu, better known as Cardinal Richelieu. He actually went there as a student, and when he became a powerful cardinal in the French court, he actually became the head of the university. And under his decree, he had a lot of the old buildings torn down and rebuilt, and he even had the iconic chapel built for the school. Most of these projects began in 1627, but the work in the chapel began in 1635. The architect was Jacques Messier, and the artwork was provided by Philippe de Campien. The chapel was built over the original chapel, which is still outlined on the floor to this day. You can actually go there and see where, you know, the outline of the old chapel was. And uh, oddly enough, the new chapel was finished the same year Rishu died, so yeah. And interestingly enough, Rishu was buried in the chapel at the Sorbonne. And when he died, he left the college a lot of money in his will, so he definitely had a fondness for the Sorbonne. 
even though I think he only went there for one year as a student, but like I said, he became the head of the school when he became cardinal and stuff, so yeah, pretty interesting. And the school, other than teaching, you know, future powerful men, it also had some pretty impactful moments, like uh, it actually introduced the art of the printing press to France when a couple of Gutenberg's associates went there to teach the French how to you know, do the printing press. So that had to be a big moment in the history of France because now France was able to print its own books. Now naturally being a religious school pretty much endorsed by the Catholic Church, the Sorbonne ran into trouble during the French Revolution. In fact, they actually closed the school. Robespierre actually made it a temple for his cult of reason, basically. Uh, the school was reopened under Napoleon, but, um, you know, the 1800s, the school was kind of bounced around a bit and then finally closed in the 1880s. In 1884, they tore down a lot of Richu's buildings and built new ones, and the project was finished in 1889, so that if you go to the Sorbonne today, basically all the buildings that you will see are from 1889. Except for the chapel and the dome, those are the only Richelieu era buildings that are still there. The new ones were designed by Henri Paul Nuneau, and uh, I mean, they're pretty nice. I like the new facade of the Sorbonne. And uh, oddly enough, though, during the French Revolution, Richelieu's face was stolen from his body because, of course, they raided his tomb and, you know, wanted trinkets and stuff, I guess. The French were showing no respect to any former religious figures. So his face was stolen, but it was held by a pretty famous family in France, the Armes family. But in 1866, Emperor Napoleon III was like, come on, guys, <laughs> put his face back. So they actually gave the face back, and they reinterred it with the, the rest of his body in the chapel. So, uh, yeah, kind of kind of weird, but... um. Yeah, the uh, Sorbonne had a kind of a crazy history in the 20th century. It was basically kind of reopened and became part of the University of Paris. But then in 1968, there were a bunch of um, students rioting and protesting. You know, it was 1968, so yeah. And so after that, they basically closed the school and separated it and broke it up into 13 other parts. And just, you know, that became part of the University of Paris. So kind of kind of weird. But um, yeah, <laughs> the building definitely has an interesting history as a place of learning. And just, you know, it's got a pretty tumultuous history like the history of France itself. Now, one thing I'm kind of confused by is the difference between the Sorbonne and the University of Paris. I guess they are separate entities, but maybe nowadays they are one and the same. It's kind of confusing. But the University of uh, Paris was actually around a lot longer than the Sorbonne. Like, I think the University of Paris was like 1150, give or take. So, yeah, kind of kind of odd. Maybe the University of Paris was around and then the Sorbonne came into being. Maybe the Sorbonne was like the theological school of the University of Paris. And then after the French wanted only secular stuff dealing with schools and their government and stuff, maybe they just, you know, broke the Sorbonne up and just made the facility teach other things. Maybe that's what happened. But yeah, I mean, the University of Paris, I mean, some of the most amazing, smart people of all time have gone there like I think Marie Curie was an uh, alumni of the university I think uh, a lot of Nobel Prize winners I think um, even Indiana Jones went to postgraduate school at the Sorbonne or the University of Paris and now he went to the University of Chicago for archaeology so yeah I think maybe he got his PhD at the Sorbonne I know he was teaching there and stuff so yeah kind of interesting but yeah I mean this is just a cool old-ass university, and uh, it's definitely going to be interesting walking around here. Okay, let's get going. Pretty cool door. I'm not sure if the game is using the original issue ever buildings, or is this the current? Uh, 
Might be the current. I don't know if they would actually have been able to, you know, get enough information and detail to be able to tell what the old buildings look like. I mean, they were demolished over a hundred years ago, so unless they had detailed photos and stuff. Well, maybe blueprints. Yeah. Okay, watch out. Man, this chapel's pretty cool. Yeah, this definitely had the influence man saw when he was designing Les Invalides, uh dome. There's Notre Dame. Yeah, got a cross on it. Theological school. Yeah, this place is pretty cool. I how many students they had back then. Alright, let's get a look. I mean, you could probably fit at least a thousand. Yeah, easily. This is a big place. Yeah, you get a good view of the Latin Quarter of uh, Paris. I'm not sure if I went into it before, but the reason why it's called the Latin Quarter is because you had you had students from all over the Europe and the world coming here. So what the hell, I got a dunce cap on them. Weird. Yeah, there's the facade, the old one or the new one. I'm not sure. But, but yeah, you had students coming from all over Europe and the world. And naturally, the only language they would know is Latin, so that's why it's called the Latin Quarter. Because if you wanted to be able to communicate with other people from around the world, you had to know Latin. That was the Franca lingua at the time, or common language. I guess English would be the common language of the world nowadays. So. Liberté mort. Man, this place is, uh, kind of a dump. <laughs> I imagine how nice it was before the revolution. Yeah, they were definitely going for a neoclassical look with this facade. Another sundial. That'd be kind of cool having my own sundial. Yeah, too bad we can't go inside, but uh, that would be kind of cool seeing Wishu's uh, tomb. I wonder if they let you see it nowadays. I mean, that guy was like, I don't know, other than Louis XIV, maybe the most impactful man on France until Napoleon. Well, maybe until... Oops, Pierre and all those guys. French Revolution fathers. And it's kind of cool too because he was like the bad guy and the three musketeers and all that. So, yeah, seeing so Wishu's uh, tomb would be pretty sweet. Yeah, I wonder if you can just walk around the sword ball nowadays. Artiste. Telescope right into the building. Nice. <laughs> Great view. I don't know what the hell these guys are doing. Oh, looks like some kind of giant magnifying glass thing. Right into the building. <laughs> yeah, Ubisoft could uh, play in this a little better. Unless they're using that to uh, look at the building's details or something. I don't really know what's going on over here, guys. Whatever. Well, I'm sure there were experiments going on all the time. What the hell is this guy in the back here? Bugger off. Running around like some madman. Yeah, so there were probably always just weird experiments going on around here. Alright, let's see what we got in here. Anything cool? Oh wow, that was worth bending over for. 
Yeah, it looks like they're doing some construction. Yeah, same picture. Yeah. Renovations, I guess. Well, let's just be happy the French didn't destroy the Sorbonne. This would have been a pretty sad loss of history. I mean, this this university is 800 years old almost. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Not sure how old Oxford and Cambridge is, but uh, this one's... Hey, they looks like they got an observatory here or something. Huh. I guess I should have looked into that. I did not know that they had one here. Yeah, this is a pretty cool, pretty cool place. Hey, prostitutes. I like the Latin Quarter. <laughs> Got a bunch of drunk Frenchmen dancing and prostitutes. Okay. Is that a clock? Yeah, I really like the French architecture. I wasn't really that well versed with it before doing this tour, but there's just something about it, you know? Got some nice restaurants. God only knows how disgusting that food would be by our standards. Well, it'd probably make you sick as hell. I mean, Saint Jacques. Guess that'd be Saint James. Oh wow. God, that's beautiful. All right, where to next? Ah, I guess the Pantheon. That's gonna be cool. Wow. I really like that tree though. 